Hello, YouTube. My name is William Morrell. Uh, we had a little audio problem with the recording at PyCon, so I am coming to you from the future with my talk, Professionally Coding with Others. Uh, I am a software engineer at Sandia National Lab, and uh, it's a more academic work environment than a typical uh, coding job. Uh, some people write code as a full-time job, but more just happen to write code as a part of getting their work done. Uh, there's some things that I've noticed in my work over the years that helped to make software transcend its usefulness to its original author, and I thought talking about it would be a good topic for PyCon. A few disclaimers up front. Uh, you don't need to have any coding anywhere in your job description or even have employment to get uh, something out of this talk and create professional quality code. Uh, you don't need to be on a team either. I believe everything that I'm going to talk about is just good practice for anyone writing software. So with that, I have a few topics that I want to cover in, these, in this talk. It is not at all exhaustive, uh, but there are things that I've observed to be important to getting other people to understand code enough to use it and work with it. So first up is documentation. Documentation is really, really important, and it's a huge topic overall. There's entire conferences like Write the Docs that cover documentation topics, and I'm just going to cover the very basics in this talk. Uh, so the most basic of documentation is the humble readme file. Uh, your project should have one of them. Uh, many tools that generate projects for you will add templates for one of these during project setup. Uh, the example that I'm showing on the slide is just a basic markdown template for a readme. Uh, your goals for the readme are to make it clear upfront what your code does and include instructions on building, running the code, how to use it, and contact information for you uh, as the person who created the code. Uh, if code is ever going to leave your system, I recommend protecting yourself, your employer or institution by including a license file with the code. Um, and you should also check licenses and any policies that your organization organization has around licenses before modifying or including somebody else's code in your projects. Uh, contributor instructions are also really important. Even if your project is entirely private right now, you should write them before you need to use them. Uh, and then there are site generators. So site generators uh, build documentation from code. Uh, there were two really great talks in the last two PyCons about using site generators um, that I had in my original version of this talk, um, but are not in this version of the slides. But I do have a repo with uh, links to those talks um, on GitHub that uh, I will provide. Uh, either in the description or later at the end of the talk. Um, site generators are, are great uh, because you can keep documentation as close to the code as possible. It's literally right there in with the code. Um, it also allows you to build documentation as a separate artifact to ship and deploy um, so others can view that documentation without having to dig through source directories. Um, Moving on, uh, version control is the next topic. And this was my method of version control when I first started seriously programming in university. Uh, this is a zip disk for those who don't know. It holds 100 megabytes of data. And when I worked on a project for class, I would uh, make a folder on this disk or copy a folder from a previous assignment and then start working on that copy. And if I needed to roll back, well, I already had the previous copy before I started working. Uh, there were better options at the time, like Subversion, and there's even better options now, namely Git. Uh, so Git has become the de facto choice for version control, mainly because of the ubiquity of GitHub. And I'm gonna focus specifics on that. Uh, but the important bit is just to use something to track changes, whether it's Git or Mercurial or Subversion or something else. So if anybody is completely new to version control, at a very high level, it allows for tracking changes to files over time. Uh, for the purposes of this talk, the essential details are that Git bundles these changes together into something called a commit. And each of these commits has a message associated with it describing the changes in that commit. 
these commits are joined together in a chain uh, with a name at the end called a branch. And that branch name lets you trace the history of changes all the way back to the first commit. Uh, a full introduction to using Git would take too much time, so I like to point to the Atlassian tutorials as a freely available introduction, and it's a little bit more accessible than just directly reading the Git manual. Um, there are other resources available online uh, for doing things that aren't quite obvious from the commands. Uh, depending on how salty you want your language, you can choose one or the other. Um, and using a graphical client can help when you're starting out to ease your transition into using it and be able to do things with a point and click kind of interface without having to memorize commands. So there's a particular failure mode in using Git and other version control that I want to highlight uh, shown in this XKCD comment, where sometimes you will start out with a reasonable description of what your changes are and as you go on and you get tired, uh, your descriptions basically become gibberish. And this isn't really useful to anybody coming to the uh, repository later. Um, so I will argue that your commit messages are documentation of code history, and you should treat your commit messages as just as important as any other documentation. So anybody coming to the code later can figure out what is going on based on the messages in those commits. So what should a commit message look like? A good first level approximation that I've found is have a first line that is very short, about 50 characters or less, of what is changing as simple as possible. And it, you should write to complete the thought, this commit will, and then that is your first line. Then have a blank line, so you have sort of a subject at the top and then a body of the commit message later, sort of like an email that describes why you are changing the things that are changing. Uh, include any uh, bug reports, error messages that were encountered, um, user stories for new features, things like that to describe why this change is being made. So one of the design decisions about Git that I really like the most is the ability to stage changes for commit separately from actually committing those changes. Uh, Git allows you to do both these things at the same time, but I will argue that doing that is a mistake. Uh, getting somebody to understand the changes you're making is a lot easier if you arrange them in a step-by-step -step way. And the easiest way to do that is to think about what you're going to put in your commit message and only add those things. Uh, in each commit. Um, so I've given a much longer talk on Git commands to help structure things in this way. Um, I don't have time to do that whole thing in this talk, but I do have a quick lightning round version of commands to use uh, with Git. So we'll start out with Git reset head tilde. This is a commit undo button. Um, this will take the previous commit and leave everything in your working directory, but undo it in the history so you can try it again. Um, so this is great for if you are doing work in progress and you have a big commit, um, you can undo it and then break it into smaller chunks that are easier to understand. Next is the patch flag to the git add command. Uh, this lets you choose individual lines or chunks of lines to stage for a commit. So sometimes you have multiple logical changes that end up within a single file, but they change for different reasons and you want to put them in different commits. Using a patch mode, you can avoid doing weird things like having a scratch pad and copy pasting uh, out of, in and out of the file or uh, abusing your editor's undo and redo function. You can just add the parts that you want and leave everything else for a later commit. Uh, the ours and theirs flags to git checkout is a handy way to handle simple merge conflicts by choosing one side or the other of the merge to keep. And the cherry pick command allows you to take a given commit hash 
and add it to the tip of your current branch. So this is great if you, for example, stumble upon a bug while you're working on another feature, you can commit a change to fix that bug and continue working on your feature branch and then cherry pick that commit out into a separate branch for a different uh, push later. So you can fix the bug immediately while still continuing to work on your feature. Last is the git rebase command, uh, particularly with the interactive flag. Uh, this one is the most complicated, but a, a simple description as I can come up with is it allows you to break a branch off from where it diverged from the rest of the code and stick it on somewhere else and replay those changes uh, from the new spot. So this is great if you have a feature that you worked on and then had to table and then come back to it and the code has changed since then, you can break it off from the past and stick it on to the present version of the code and uh, continue working from that point. Uh, the next topic I wanted to talk about are code quality tools. Uh, so there's a long history of computer programs that are designed to analyze other programs. And incorporating these tools into your workflow can help you to work faster, have better code, and make code that is easier for others to use. Uh, the classical example of this is the linter. So this comes from the Unix utility called lint uh, that would uh, scan over C code and find uh, problems with style or uh, problematic constructs. Uh, much like a lint roller going over your clothing can pick up bits of fur and dust and lint. Um, in Python, uh, the most widespread versions of linters are PyLint and Flake 8. Uh, both will check for conformance to the PEP8 official style guide and provide a bunch of additional style checks outside of PEP8 for potential errors or confusing constructs. Uh, they also each support plugins to add further code checks, and you can add your own checks if you find something is problematic in your own environment. So linters are great, but they only really give you a laundry list of details with your code. They don't modify your code. Uh, for that, we have another class of tools called auto formatters, and these will read in your code and then write that code back out following some uh, deterministic rules. Uh, I will further classify formatters as being comprehensive, so they do the entire file or have narrow scope. Um, so uh, for narrow scope, we have tools like iSort that will um, read in the import statements in your code and uh, arrange them alphabetically, much like a bookstore will have uh, sections of books arranged alphabetically by authors. So that just makes it easier when you have a longer list of things to quickly narrow in on where something is located. Um, there's also the uh, upgrade tools like two to three in the standard library or pi upgrade. Um, that will rewrite code in older, older Python code uh, idioms and uh, write them in newer uh, idioms, such as taking the print expression from Python 2 and making it a print function in Python 3, or PyUpgrade will do things like take percent formatted strings and convert them to string.format calls and then into F strings. Uh, comprehensive formatters are black in Python. Um, black will read in your code and write it out in a standard style. There are other formatters for Python, like uh, yet another Python formatter or YAPF um, that has a similar utility, uh, but um, has a little bit more flexibility. Um, black seems to be the standard these days. Um, and I am stumbling here because I noticed that these slides are from a different version of this talk where I talked about more than just Python. So here are some other formatters that are available. Uh, my notes do not match my slides. So once you have these code quality tools, where do you run them? You can run all of these as standalone commands. Um, which is great, but that's not always what you want to do. So 
integrating things in your IDE or editor can help with workflow quite a bit by um, giving you immediate feedback on changes that are being made. Uh, you can also run them with your project tests. So when you run your test suite, just also run all these code quality tools and uh, treat it just as if it's another kind of test. It's a test on the quality of the code versus uh, the functionality of the code. Um, you can also have them run in continuous integration steps, and this is a great thing to do. So you just, when you integrate your code in uh, Jenkins or uh, GitHub Actions, um, just run these steps to check uh, the quality of your code. Uh, the one that I want to highlight is using a tool called pre-commit. So pre-commit is a Python application, uh, but it is not specific to Python code. It will run on any Git repo. Uh, and you give it a config file like shown on the right, um, and you can define different checks to run on your code before you actually commit the code. Um, so this helps to identify any issues in your code before you commit it and push it to others uh, so you can fix it early. Uh, the next topic that I want to talk about is pull requests. So pull requests are a way of collaboration that has gained a lot of popularity over the last 15 or so years due to the implementations of GitHub and similar tools. So common Git platforms provide many extra features around pull requests to do things like line by line suggestions and review, uh, approvals of requests, automation hooks, and it can be a little bit daunting if you're not accustomed to working this way. So what are pull requests at a basic level? They are quite literally a request to pull code. Uh, the request has a source branch and a target branch where the desired end state is for the target branch to reach out to the source and pull those changes in. Uh, this process looks similar to a practice that has been around much longer of sending a patch of additions and deletions to the code from a known state. The difference is rather than tossing this patch over to someone, the patch is pulled by those that are maintaining the target branch. As a consequence, either or both of these branches can change between initiating the pull request and the merging of that pull request, and all the updates that, ha that uh, happen in that intervening time are included. So I think this is the killer feature of pull requests, and I want to really stress how understanding this can unlock better collaborations. I've seen so many devs treat sending a pull request like sending a patch, where rather than doing a simple update to the branch in response to feedback, they close the original request, make a new branch, make a new pull request, and submit it. And it's so much better to just update your branches and keep all that context in your original review. So what are the goals that we have with pull requests? The obvious one is getting the code merged, uh, but I don't think that's the full story. Some people will work on projects and just merge directly into the main branch, and it's entirely possible to work without pull requests at all. So what else do you get? Part of what you get is the ability to get feedback from help fellow humans in an easy manner. You just uh, push your branch, uh, submit a pull request and somebody has a quick web view into the code and can scan through it and give quick feedback. I will argue that the most important piece is context transfer. So getting somebody else to understand the changes that you're making to the code and the code base overall. So it's a little bit like doing asynchronous pair programming. So the more people you have who know how to maintain a particular project, the more that everyone involved gets the ability to take a vacation without the project dying. Uh, Chelsea Troy has a series of articles about this on her website under the temporarily distributed tag. Um, I got a lot of inspiration on her writing on this uh, and using pull requests as an effective way to transfer knowledge and context in both directions between the submitter and the reviewer. Um, doing this is a lot more work than it would initially seem, but it's work that is really worth it. Um, and I think her insights into this are really great. Uh, the last topic that I have for 
today is dependency management. Uh, so it's practically impossible today to have any software that doesn't at some level depend on other software or firmware to function correctly. And dependency management is a set of tools and practices we have to make sure that software has everything it needs to function in place. So I have a story to illustrate this. Uh, there's a tradition in computer science of telling stories about software with characters having names following the letters of the alphabet. And traditionally, the first two characters in the story are named Alice and Bob. So we have Alice and Alice has a problem to solve. And Bob has a program that solves a similar problem. So Alice asks for advice from Bob on how to solve that problem. And Bob gives the advice and points out sections of the code to modify for Alice's problem. Alice makes those changes, runs the code, and gets an import error. So in Python, we know how to solve this. You look at the package that is missing in the import error, you find out what Python package uh, is needs to be installed for that, you install it and you run it again. So Alice does this a few times and gets a couple more import errors and everything is unsolved and then gets a file not found error because there's a config file that needs to be put in place, but it's missing from code. So you can imagine after doing all of this, if Alice uh, gets asked by Bob, hey, how's it going? Did, did everything work? Alice would respond, not great, Bob. So this problem of it works on my machine uh, is a big one, and we want to avoid it. Uh, it's something that wasted a lot of Alice's time in taking something that would have been just a quick modification to code and then having all these sort of knock on following issues because the environment wasn't set up properly. So one way we have to ameliorate this is to do version pinning of dependencies. So uh, when you pip install something like pip install flask, that installs flask, but it also installs a few other things. Uh, you have to keep a list of the things that you're installing, like the packages on the left, but you also need to keep a list of the exact versions of those things that you're installing, like the list on the right. Um, because a minor version of one of the things on the right can update and end up breaking your code. In Python, we also have this comic that gets sent around quite a bit. Um, it's not always easy to get an environment set up in the proper way, and things used to be pretty bad. Uh, this comic is only a little bit hyperbole. Uh, we, you would all often have several different Pythons installed on a system, and it wasn't entirely clear which one was running at any given point in time, and multiple different site packages directories with Python packages installed. Uh, I would just recommend using a tool like Poetry. Uh, there's a couple of different projects now like Poetry. Um, I've just found Poetry the easiest to use. Um, and this provides high level dependency management similar to what other languages have had for a while, like Cargo with Rust or Yarn for Node. Uh, Poetry provides an interface to PIP for managing packages, to VM for managing virtual environments, and to set up tools for building and packaging your own packages. You can use all the underlying tools still. Poetry just ties them together in a simple way for the majority of cases. It also gets you version pinning by default and also includes content hashes for the files in each package. Uh, this provides an extra layer of protection for certain supply chain attacks where a legitimate package has files uh, replaced with malicious code. Uh, one other method of helping with dependency management is using containers. Um, so there's a few caveats to using Python in containers. Um, there's the ways that some uh, people recommend structuring Docker containers don't really work very well for Python. Uh, but Edemar Turner Taring uh, has a site pythonspeed.com um, that has a lot of articles on using Docker and Python together 
Uh, he has over 50 so far on packaging, security, performance, and other things to get the most out of using Docker. And that's all I have for the talk. Uh, thank you all for your attention. And I'll just leave you with a few words to try to summarize the last few minutes of this talk. Uh, I think all of this really comes down to leaving the code better off than you originally found it and taking opportunities to consider a project as if you're a newcomer and make it easier to dive in and make incremental improvements. So just having that thought in mind as you apply all these tools and resources helps to make your code consistent and easier to understand and make all your code usable by others. So thank you all again.